Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is John Cotrera. I'm a director in BKD's National Government Group. I've been involved with the county's, both the county's financial audit and single audit uh, for the past couple of years. Uh, with me today, I have Kim Marshall and uh, Teresa Seymour. I'll allow them to introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kim Marshall. I'm a director, um, also in the national government practice. I've been auditing governments for about 15 years, and the majority of my clients have a lot of federal funding, so I have a lot of experience with single audits. Sure. And I'm Teresa Seymour, and I'm a senior manager in the Wichita office, and I've been doing government for about 12 years as well. So, right. so Sorry. again, we're excited to be here this morning to really, the, the goal of today's training is to really get everybody involved in the grant management function for the county all in one room and, and really make sure that you know we're all on the same page when it comes to not only the financial reporting side of things, but also the program compliance side of things. Because as, as we get into these, to these requirements, and as I'm sure many of, of you are aware of, they're so intertwined between finance and, and, and the actual execution of the program. So we want to make sure that the folks who may not have a, a good or a strong background in the financial reporting side of things at least provide um, so, some training um, as to what the folks in finance need to do with these grants and, and vice versa for the, for the people in the finance department to really have a better understanding of what the program requirements are associated with these grant agreements. We know that you know grants are a great thing. The county receives a, a lot of them and it's, it's a good thing to have. Uh, but with them comes that responsibility and there's rigorous requirements associated with these grant agreements. So again, just want to make sure that um, we're all on the same page and have, have a good understanding as to what these requirements are so that we can execute on them uh, when we're working on them in our day-to-day -day, uh, operations. So with that, just by a show of hands, if I could see how many people would describe themselves as not really having a financial reporting or accounting background? Okay, so probably about half the room. So the, the first hour uh, today, uh, I should say the first about 40 minutes is going to be very heavy on accounting and financial reporting, so I apologize to hit you with uh, GASB standards 9 a.m. on a dreary Monday morning, but um, that's what we were asked to do here, so um, we could all get excited for that. So, uh, And then I'm going to provide a, a, a background on uniform guidance uh, and, and a single audit overview. Hopefully we're all pretty familiar, but um, just kind of go over what our function is uh, with the single audit. We'll take a quick break. Um, Kim's going to discuss internal controls over compliance and the uniform guidance compliance, really get into the meat and potatoes of uh, the uniform guidance there. Um, and Teresa is going to discuss the effects of uh, uniform guidance on procurement procedures. So those uh, requirements were delayed and, and are going to be very relevant for the upcoming audit. So uh, we'll want to make sure that we touch on those um, and we're all on the same page as it relates to that. We also have a lot of examples today to try to really help you apply this uh, to, to your day-to-day -day job. Uh, so as we're going through those examples, feel free to ask questions, and, and furthermore, as we're just going through the slides, if there are any questions that come up, feel free, um, or if you'd like to speak with one of us during the break, and, and we have set aside a time uh, at, at the end of the presentation today to go over, wrap up, and whatever questions you may have. So with that, I will get into um, a governmental accounting and reporting overview. And, and please note that uh, I'm not going to go through each one of these slides. I, I did leave many slides in here just as a point of reference for you. Uh, much of this, I shouldn't say much, but some of this won't really apply to the grant management process, but still gives you that background on governmental accounting if you wanted to go back and refer, refer to it try, to try to understand if you're looking at something in the CAFR or may have a question on how something's being reported. We did leave those slides in there as a reference for you. Um, so don't uh, think that we're short on time if we're kind of going through some of these slides uh, rather quickly. So this first slide here just goes through the differences between governmental accounting and the private sector and really um, won't touch on each of these, but a few things I want to point out here is obviously governments aren't in it for the money. They're, they're um, here to serve residents. They're citizens. They're not here to make money. So there's no profit motive. So along those lines, you're going to have these oops, you're going to have these non-exchange transactions here, uh, and these are unique to the governmental sector, and grants are basically volunteer non-exchange transactions, and they have different financial reporting requirements than, we, than we'd be used to typically seeing in the private sector or on a typical exchange-like transaction. We're obviously responsible to the pro providers of resources, um, so the grantors, and, and we have different ways 
to demonstrate that compliance through the use of fund accounting and through the use of various cost centers. So think of your grant as, as its own accounting entity. You could have, you know, it's, it's going to have its, its assets, its liabilities, its deferred outflow, outflows, inflows potentially, um, and it's going to have residual fund balance. Some governmental accounting acronyms I, I won't really cover. Um, Principles of governmental accounting, again, fund accounting, we're, we're using fund accounting to demonstrate compliance to show that, uh, you know, it, it makes it a lot easier to demonstrate to these grantors that we're spending the money and executing the program uh, the way it should be. Uh, before we get too much into the detail on governmental accounting, just want to make sure I mention the fund categories, which are governmental, proprietary, and fiduciary. So governmental... Um, You'll notice at the end of each one of these, parenthetically, I've listed out the measurement focus and basis of accounting. Um, so we'll see that governmental funds use modified accrual and current measurement focus. Um, just file that away because we're going to discuss that uh, shortly. Um, the government-wide statements, so these are presented on full accrual basis, what you would typically see in the private sector. And um, basically what these are meant to do is just summarize all the activity for the county. Um, for all the funds summarized into um, basically one statement. You're going to have governmental activities, which represents all your governmental funds. The county does have a business type activity, which is actually the arena, not too much relevance to this group. Capital assets and long-term debt have some unique reporting requirements for governments, which I will not get into. Um, in terms of financial reporting, and, and really the, the main thing I want to emphasize here, hopefully everybody's aware of the fact that the county produces a comprehensive annual financial report on an annual basis. And this report is, is important for many reasons. Many parties rely on the information in there. Um, and one of, the, one of the parties that does are grantors. So they're looking at this CAFR and making sure that you know, everything is being reported uh, from a financial perspective. Um, they, are, they are reviewing this CAFR, so it's important to make sure that obviously the balances we're presenting um, are correct. Measurement focus and basis of accounting. So these are the building blocks of every transaction answers these three W questions, what, where, and when. Uh, so your definition of measurement focus is it basically tells us what kind of assets, liabilities, revenues, expenditures, and expenses we're going to um, look at when we're recording transactions. And there are two measurement focuses here. We have the flow of economic resources measurement focus. So this is the most common in private sector. Again, our, our enterprise funds and our government-wide statements are going to be using this. And we have the flow of current, current financial resources measurement focus. This is the more traditional fund accounting measurement focus. So this just looks, operates more like a checkbook and as the name indicates, indicates has a current measurement focus. This is important because depending on when we receive some of the funding from grantors and, and what type of expenditures we've incurred at the fund level, That'll dictate what our financial statement balances are going to be. So we need to understand what measurement focus we're applying this to. So again, some characteristics of the economic resources measurement focus. Um, won't get into too much detail. Again, this is uh, what you typically see in the pri private sector. Current financial resources measurement focus. Uh, we could see here uh, measures only available spendable resources. So the concept of availability is a very important concept, um, and it goes along with that current measurement focus. We're only looking out so far as to whether this, the revenues that we're going to be coming in to determine whether those can pay for current liabilities um, for, that, for that current period. We're not going to take a long-term view with the current measurement focus. And again, in a few slides, we'll see why this is so important to emphasize. Uh, some of the differences, the main differences are between these two measurement focuses, again, are capital assets and long-term debt related, not too uh, relevant to grant reporting. Uh, now, basis of accounting, uh, it, it describes if and when to record the asset liability, revenue, or expense, so obviously different than our uh, measurement focus. There are two types here. You got the full accrual and the modified accrual, so full accrual. Full accrual is, is the entity-wide statements, those government-wide statements, the, the, the full accrual statements. Modified accrual, again, those are our governmental funds. That's our federal state um, assistance fund and, and the various cost centers when, within there. That's our general fund. So we're using the modified accrual basis of accounting. <clears throat> so uh, differences between the two full accrual basis, you'll see here revenue is recorded when earned regardless of when it's received. 
Modified accrual basis, revenue is recorded when collected or collectible soon enough to be used to pay current liabilities. Again, our, current, our, uh, our period of availability. We want to be able to pay current liabilities with that money. Um, the equity associated with, with each of these um, is captioned a bit differently in the report, but um, works essentially the same as it relates to grants. Um, so you'll have three components broken out for net position here. Uh, which are net investment and capital assets restricted and unrestricted. If you were to take a look at the county's CAFR from this most recent year, you would see there is a restriction at the entity-wide level for federal state um, assistance. So basically what this represents is revenue that's been provided to the county that they they were able to recognize in accordance with GASB 33, but it hasn't been spent out. So you got to set that aside. Um, you can't just display that as money that's free for the county to spend on whatever they um, would like. That that money obviously has to be spent um, on what the uh, programs initiatives uh, dictate. Same concept at the fund level here. So our state and federal grant assistance fund will show a restricted type fund balance. Um, for whatever revenue they were able to recognize. Um, general fund, too, if there are grants reported there in the general fund, which are going to be primarily um, the two areas you'd be looking at. So again, fund accounting, uh, unique to the governmental sector, and the main reason for it is it emphasizes accountability rather than profitability. Uh, so again, the, the county has the federal, state, and assistance fund and the various cost centers within there, which, which are going to be able to help us um, appropriately identify what revenues and expenses were incurred associated with the grant and make sure that the year-end balances are reported um, correctly. Minimum number of funds, I won't spend too much time. Uh, so again, we, the three fund categories that I had mentioned, uh, governmental, proprietary, and fiduciary, we'll just briefly go over a few governmental fund types, uh, and that's going to be the special revenue, special revenue funds and the general fund. First, the general fund, so this is the primary operating fund of the county, um, accounts for all re everything that hasn't been accounted for in another fund. Um, GAP only allows one, um, so you only have one general fund. Um, it reports various departments, and it could report you know, uh, activity related to grants. Um, and if it does, you know, we'll, whatever revenue is recognized associated with that, we shouldn't be uh, restricting. Special revenue funds, these are going to be where your grants um, are, are displayed uh, for the most part. Um, again, these are used mostly to, um, legally, to account for specific revenue sources that are legally restricted. So, um, again, grants being restricted by an outside party will, will fall into this category. And again, these are very useful in demonstrating uh, legal compliance and compliance uh, with, with grant uh, requirements. Some examples of special revenue funds. Um, you'll see here voluntary non-exchange transactions, grants um, is a big use for these. Um, so uh, special revenue funds, very, very useful tool in terms of recognizing this grant activity. Debt service funds, capital project funds, permanent funds, I won't spend a lot of time on. Uh, feel free to go back and refer to it. Um, proprietary funds, uh, we got enterprise funds and internal service funds. Again, the only enterprise fund for the county is the arena. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on here, but uh, enterprise funds are basically meant to operate like the, a private sector business, uh, recover the costs associated with a certain function. Internal service funds, the county has four of those, which are related to fleet, um, and then three related to insurance, risk management, uh, workers' comp, and health. Uh, these are a little different than those internal service funds in that they're meant to operate on a, um, a cost reimbursement basis, so you're not going to have any ongoing surplus or deficit with these internal service funds. Some of the differences there. And these are all the other remaining fund types. I'm not going to get into the detail on these. If you'd be interested in looking at what agency funds are, the county does report some agency funds. Uh, may not be too relevant in your day-to-day -day operations, though. But again, something you could refer back to if you're so interested to. So that'll lead us into GASB 33. Um, and we worked GASB 33 into the presentation today, uh, not because it's new or up and coming, um, but it's actually a, quite an old standard. Um, goes back about 15 years, I want to say. But we worked it into this, to the presentation today because it's extremely relevant with 
grant reporting and recording these balances in the financial statements. Um, and, and really, you know, if you don't have a good understanding of GASB 33 and a good understanding of the grant agreement um, and applying the provisions of GASB 33, it's very likely that you could wind up with, with an incorrect balance um, being reported. So again, it's important that finance gets the information they need and, and, and finance and program managers are both on the same page with these grant agreements and how it's being interpreted um, and then executing on those journal entries and, and recording them at year end. So uh, the purpose is to provide local governments uh, the standards with uh, about when to report the results of non-exchange transactions. Um, so that is, again, the purpose of GASB 33, voluntary non-exchange transactions being grants. Before we get into the non-exchange transactions, just want to touch on the um, exchange type transactions. So uh, exchange-like transactions, this definition is pretty self-explanatory. It's where you're giving up equal value in a transaction. Uh, there are also exchange-like transactions. Uh, so an exchange-like transaction is, is a transaction where you're not quite exactly even there. Um, or the benefits may not be entirely for each party involved. Nonetheless, the characteristics of the transaction are strong enough uh, to justify an exchange-like transaction. Uh, for both of the uh, items mentioned, uh, we're going to be using the accrual basis of accounting, and we're going to recognize revenue um, at the point that the exchange occurs. So this is pretty simple, straightforward. I think everybody could, could agree with this and, and get behind this. So it gets a little different now when we get into these non-exchange transactions. And non-exchange transactions um, is a transaction when a government gives up or receives value without directly receiving that same value um, in exchange. So there are four classes of, of non-exchange transactions mentioned here, which are derived tax revenues, imposed non-exchange revenues, government mandated non-exchange transactions, and of course those voluntary non-exchange transactions, which is going to be what we're dealing most with um, on our grants. I'll briefly cover the first three, and then we'll spend a little more time on voluntary non-exchange transactions and get into some examples here um, in a few minutes. So our derived tax revenues, these represent um, result from assessments imposed by governments on exchange transactions. Uh, the most common examples that we'll see are going to be income taxes, sales taxes, assessments on consumption, so we could have some motor fuel tax or, or whatever it might be. But the point is it's a tax that's being imposed on an exchange transaction between two other parties. Um, you know, another example would be the exchange of employee services for wages um, could be a, another potential one. So the government is imposing um, the provision of resources on the provider here of that exchange transaction. In terms of the accounting, uh, the asset side is pretty straightforward. Basically when the underlying exchange occurs or resources are received, it's whichever comes first. Now revenues are going to be recorded uh, when the underlying ex uh, transaction occurs, but we also have to, again, factor in that, that availability criteria. And again, I'm going to touch on this a few times here, but um, you know, available means it's collected soon enough after the end of the period to use to pay current liabilities. Goes back to that current measurement focus that we discussed on the governmental accounting um, background a few slides back. This period of availability, and it could be anywhere from 30 to 180 days. The county uses 60 days. Um, it could shift. It, it could depend on the circumstances of the situation and the revenue source, but the county uses 60 days. So anything not collected within 60 days we're saying isn't available and really can't be recognized as revenue even if that underlying exchange transaction did occur. Imposed non-exchange revenues, so these are um, assessments imposed on non-governmental entities um, other than assessments on exchange transactions. So our most common example here is going to be property taxes. Uh, the principal characteristics on these is, is the required transmittal of resources is um, composed, imposed by the government based on, um, it's based on an act either committed or omitted by that party who's being assessed the tax. Um, so in our property taxes example, uh, home ownership, the, the act of home ownership results in this uh, imposed non-exchange transaction taking place. So again, the key here is it's not an exchange transaction. The asset side of things is, is 
pretty much recorded in a similar manner uh, as uh, derived tax revenues. No real difference there. Revenues, we'll have to just take a look at. Um, so they're, they're recognized in the period when the use of the resources is required or first permitted by time requirements. And uh, again, going back to our property taxes, this could line up with the, with the period in which the uh, taxes are levied or, or intended to finance. Government mandated non-exchange transactions. Um, so this is where we're going to have a government uh, provide resources to another government and require them um, to use the resources for a specific purpose. Um, so a common example is a, a federal program that a state government is mandated to perform. Could be a state um, requiring a county to perform a certain function. Um, but the point is the, that the, the government is either the receiving government is required to either perform that function or they're required to facilitate its performance um, either through another government or even a non-governmental entity. But those are the main um, identifying criteria of a government mandated non-exchange transaction. Before I get into the accounting on a government mandated non-exchange transaction, I'll cover voluntary, not voluntary non-exchange transactions um, because the accounting is virtually the same for these two. So. Voluntary non-exchange transactions um, are contractual agreements entered into willingly by two or more parties. Grants are going to be a very common example here. Private donations. Uh, governments aren't so lucky um, in that regard. Um, but if that did ever come up, that would be another situation where we have a voluntary non-exchange transaction. The accounting for the voluntary non-exchange transactions is, is listed out here on this slide. So the asset to the recipient and the liability to the provider um, is going to be recognized when all applicable eligibility requirements are met or resources are received. Again, that's whichever comes first. The revenues associated with the non-exchange transactions will be recognized uh, when the revenues and and or expenses um, uh, will be recognized when all applicable eligibility requirements are met. And again, there's that modified accrual revenues that we discussed um, and the available criteria. So you can hit your eligibility criteria on these grant agreements. You could execute what you needed to for the program if it's you know expenditure driven or if you had a match or whatever it might be. You can, you can hit that and still wind up not recognizing revenue. So you need to be aware of this period of availability. We need to understand when are we really going to get these resources from the provider um, and have a good forecast and make sure we're communicating and understand. Um, and that's going to really help finance in, in terms of how they're reporting these balances. Stipulations on, on the use of resources. So uh, the next three slides deals with this. Uh, so GASB 33 mentions a few things here, first of which are time requirements. Um, and time requirements can come in a few different forms um, per GASB 33. Um, it could be the period the resources are required to be used or when use may begin. So you might, in certain situations, get grant funding up front, but you can't really use it till the beginning of the year, beginning of the grantor's fiscal year, whatever it might be. That would be a time requirement. You could also have a situation where resources are required to remain intact until a specified date. Um, not as common on, in the governmental realm, but that is another form of a time requirement um, there. Uh, purpose restrictions. So, and, and this is really kind of what I want to spend some time on, is making sure we understand the difference between a purpose restriction and an eligibility criteria, because it really makes a huge difference in how these are re reported and can result in misstatements if we're not correctly understanding and interpreting the agreement and applying it, applying GASB 33 um, accordingly. So purpose restrictions basically specify the purpose for which the resources are required to be used. The key thing to, to take into consideration here is it doesn't affect when the transaction is recognized, but it does result in restricted net position or fund balance. So thinking back to those slides on equity, that restriction for Fed state assistance, um, or the restriction at the fund level for that particular fund. So we recognize that revenue but we um, you know, obviously restrict it. So really just, again, understanding the difference between purpose restrictions and eligibility criteria. Eligibility criteria I am, I am gonna cover in a couple slides here. So eligibility requirements are conditions um, established by the provider that are required to be met before the transaction can occur. So you, unlike purpose restrictions, you can't recognize revenue until you uh, address these eligibility criteria. And this is where finance probably needs help 
hey, have we done what we, we needed to do for this grant? Have we executed on, on these uh, eligibility criteria identified in the grant agreement? And again, that's why it's so important to really go through these agreements, understand these eligibility criteria uh, up front, and, and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Because if, if you don't really have it documented appropriately up front, you'll be scrambling and may have misinterpreted something and, and ultimately result in a misstatement uh, to the county's financial statements. So our eligibility requirements are broken into four different categories here. Uh, there could be required characteristics of recipients. So this one could be simple enough as it has to be given to a county or it has to be given to a municipality, it has to be given to a school district. That one's simple enough, probably simple enough to address if, if it requires you to be a county while well, you're a county. So uh, not a real big issue there. There could be time requirements uh, that are associated with eligibility criteria um, and we did kind of cover what those could include. Uh, reimbursements, so this is what's referred to as a, a reimbursement type or expenditure driven grant. So if the grant agreement stipulates that you need to spend the money first and execute the program and show us that you spent this money, then it's an expenditure driven grant under GASB 33. You can't recognize that award until you're showing them on a quarterly or monthly basis that you're executing the program and you've actually spent the money. And, and that's where we, there could be some confusion between that and purpose restrictions. If, if you may get a, a grant that just has a purpose restriction and it could be misinterpreted as, as being eligibility criteria and that's how you wind up with the misstatement. So that's why again just understanding what's in the grant agreement, what do we truly have to do and making sure that that is conveyed to the finance department I think will go a long way in, in making sure that you know, these balances are recorded correctly and, and we don't run into any hiccups um, during the audit process. Contingencies is another uh, eligibility criteria um, under GASB 33. So this could be, hey, we're going to give you this grant, but you need to fundraise. You need to raise $100,000 in order to get the money. So you can't recognize that revenue until you've hit that um, contingency. Or they may say, we're going to give you hundred thousand dollars but you got to come in with a hundred of your own from local funding uh, and that again is a, is a contingency so you can't recognize the revenue until you've executed on that uh, requirement that's written into the agreement um, and again I'm gonna go through examples on, on each of these uh, to help you better understand um, and kind of work through that so again basis of accounting considerations I said I was gonna mention it a few times hopefully my last time here but don't forget, if you've addressed all these eligibility criteria, don't assume you're good to go. You've got to still get the money, and, and the money's got to come in soon enough to pay for current financial uh, or, or current liabilities. And if it doesn't, then we're going to cover GASB 65 here, because GASB 65 tells us whether we should recognize a deferred inflow or an unearned uh, revenue, which would be a liability. Um, and really it's broken out here. The only time you'll recognize a liability is if you have an unearned uh, or if you have an eligibility criteria that you have not yet addressed. Deferred inflows uh, basically represent timing issues. I won't get too much into the details on this. This isn't necessarily a new standard. GASB 65 is about five years old and is implemented for the county's 2013 year end, but the intent of it was to take liabilities take assets and look if look to determine if they should be captioned differently um, based on what they actually are um, and really I'll just focus on deferred inflows and liabilities um, the important thing though is to not assume that these are the same thing so while it is true that anything captioned as a deferred inflow now previously was reported a liability they're, they're definitely two different things and, and the main differentiator between the two is that deferred inflows a lot of times will represent a, a transaction where the resources of the county are actually going to increase. You could have a deferred inflow for availability criteria. That's not a liability. You recognize it as a deferred inflow because you're going to get it just not within the period of availability. So ultimately the next period, although it's a deferred inflow, it's going to increase your net resources. So that's not really a liability to the county. The liabilities represent certain or potential reductions of resources. So then thinking back to the one liability you'll have with grants, the one liability you'll have is um, a grant where you have not hit the eligibility criteria. So it's possible that you might not hit that eligibility criteria and you're not 
you could ultimately reduce your resources then if we don't hit that eligibility criteria. So again, GASB 33 kind of feeds into 65 on these issues. The important thing to remember is you're pretty much going to have a deferred inflow unless it's eligibility criteria. So that's why, again, it's just so important for finance to really be able to know what they're dealing with, you know, why they're, they're recording a credit on the balance sheet or on the statement in that position. Um, and then that, that, that's going to give them the, the chance to be able to caption it appropriately uh, come out at time. Any questions so far? I know I've kind of tried to bring people up to speed here on governmental accounting pretty quickly. Um, just trying to give you the necessary background that you have. Um, again, feel free if there's any questions, um, to feel free to interrupt me. I will get into some examples here then to help you kind of apply this and understand it. Uh, so in this example, we have a $500,000 grant that's been given to a county um, to the election commission. So it's for election activities. The timing of the grant award is November 1, 2018 to October 31st of 2019. Um, and here we have the funds being requested right away. The county got the award agreement the first day they could request it. They requested it and they got the money November 8th. Now this grant does require quarterly progress reports uh, be submitted to the, uh, to the grantor to monitor the progress of the grant. So they want to make sure that it's being used for election activities. And I did have a little journal entry template, but in the interest of time and, and the glazed over eyes right now, we'll just kind of go on to the uh, solution here, uh, which is, um, <laughs> so this grant basically illustrates the characteristics of that purpose-based grant. Um, so it does specify a purpose that it's going to be used for election activities, but thinking back to those four eligibility criteria, so is there a contingency in there? I didn't think there was. Um, timing requirements, they didn't really mention anything there. Um, required characteristics, um, there was nothing there either. Um, so I think we're good on the eligibility criteria. The filing of the reports is, is pretty routine in nature. We wouldn't call that an eligibility criteria. So again, we have just a purpose-based grant. That means we could pretty much recognize this revenue so at year end, we're going to just recognize the receivable, um, you know, or cash, whatever it might be in, in this situation, it's actually cash. Um, and, and just point is, though, we're recognizing the revenue here. So we're increasing our net resources. We're increasing our fund balance. We're increasing our net position. So being that we have that, we got to make sure our residual net position is captioned as restricted um, at fiscal year end. Uh, which is, uh, again, what we would do on the entity-wides um, or, or the, the, the fund level statement for the federal state assistance grant fund. This next example is that same exact grant with one little wrinkle here, and that's that the grant specifies that expenditures only be made from the beginning of the calendar year through the end of the grant term. So that sounds to me like a timing requirement. So we got this money, but we can't really spend it yet. So we're going to go through a couple journal entries here. At the end of the year, we have this money that we haven't, um, that we can't really spend yet. Um, so we need to make sure that we record it. You know, we got to get the cash on there. Um, so we're going to do that by put hitting again, thinking back to that. GASB 65 slide, we're going to hit a deferred inflow. We're not going to hit a liability. So this is just a timing issue. It's going to increase our resources eventually. We're going to recognize it as a deferred inflow now. Um, and then when we're able to spend it, come January 1, when we've addressed that time requirement, now we're good to go and we could spend it, you're going to recognize that revenue. You're going to take away that deferred inflow and you're going to go ahead and recognize that revenue because you've addressed that eligibility requirement. In this next example, uh, a state reimburses counties for a county for specific costs related to opioid addiction up to a maximum of $100,000. To obtain the reimbursement for allowable costs, the county submits quarterly reports. The state's fiscal year is 12 1 to 11 30. So then in December, the county incurred and requested reimbursement for $25,000. Payment was received from the state on April 2nd. So the state's 
pretty slow to pay here. Maybe we're in Illinois, for example. Um, and the county has a 90-day period of availability here. So we're a couple days late. So we'll go through a couple journal entries here. Um, but first kind of go through what we're looking at here. So the fulfillment of the two eligibility criteria, criteria um, is necessary for this transaction to occur. Uh, we need to make sure that the recipient's a county, which is pretty easy. Uh, the applicable period had to have begun and the county should have incurred allowable costs. So we have an expenditure driven grant here. We have a reimbursement basis grant. They're, they're not going to give us money until we show that we've earned it. Um, so then the recognition of the revenue, so for that $25,000, we've showed we've earned it. We've spent it in December, and we can record our receivable and recognize our revenue. Again, though, you got to factor in the other layer of availability. So we didn't get it till April 2nd. So when we're dealing with the current measurement focus, it's going to wind up again being a deferred inflow. We didn't get it in time. Um, when we're dealing with the flow of economic resources measurement focus, the full accrual basis of accounting, we throw that availability criteria out the window so we are able to recognize that revenue. So again, just, just emphasizing the point that even if you've addressed the eligibility criteria, make sure you follow through the transaction um, and you're recognizing, uh, t paying attention to the availability criteria and recognizing the revenue accordingly. Next one here, we have a multi-year pledge, $500,000 to the county hospital to further its mission of serving the indigent. Uh, the letter specifies that uh, this generous person will, will pay $100,000 over the next five years, and that each installment will be used in the year it's paid. So we'll just go through the first year's journal entry here, but again, this is a voluntary non-exchange transaction. Um, fulfillment of eligibility requirement is necessary in the form of time requirements. Um, so assuming that the hospital feels that the collections on this award are going to happen, uh, we'll recognize that $100,000 in the first year and then we'll recognize it um, in each uh, succeeding year. Uh, and the requirement that it served the indigent is, is, is really that's part of the general operations of the county, so we're not really dealing with a purpose restriction here either. So again, our journal entry here, we're going to recognize um, that pledge receivable and revenue um, you know, on, on the first day of the year. And uh, the same entry is going to be recorded in each of the subsequent four years. Next one here is, is we got a matching contingency. So a county is awarded a $100,000 grant to be used for salaries of a covert narcotics group within the Sheriff's Department. The agreement stipulates that half of the total salaries must come from local county resources. So again, there's our contingency re eligibility requirement. Total salaries budgeted at $200,000. The grant period is 7-1 to 6-30. Funds can be requested any time. Quarterly match reports are required. Um, here we have the funds requested on July 1, received July 8, and then at December 31, the county has incurred $50,000. So the county got all the money up front, but at fiscal year end, they've really only earned $50,000 because of the eligibility criteria. They, have, they, they haven't matched that entire grant award. They've only matched you know half of it with that $50,000. So again, the journal entry templates, and again, fulfillment of the eligibility requirement here is necessary in the form of the 50% match, so grant funding is contingent upon the match taking place. You don't have the money unless you, you show that you're uh, funding some of this from your local resources. Uh, the filing of the quarterly match reports is pretty routine in nature, and that should not be interpreted as an eligibility re requirement. This should actually read cash, um, but again, cash or grant receivable, um, in July, and since we're dealing with an eligibility criteria issue, we haven't met that contingency yet. Notice we're not using a deferred inflow. We're using an unearned uh, revenue um, in the form of a liability here. So again, that's the difference between the GASB 65 discussion that I was having. Um, at year end, we've shown that we've earned 50000 of this, so there we can reverse that liability and go ahead and recognize that revenue at fiscal year end. Our last example here just deals with a large corporation that um, donates $5 million to a local community college so that the college acquire and refurbish a building near campus. The building is going to be used for classrooms and labs. 
um, and they also want their name prominently displayed on this on this building. So there's really no eligibility criteria in there. I mean, they are asking that they put the name on the building, but you know, again, thinking back to those four eligibility criteria, doesn't really uh, fall into either one of those categories. Um, the requirement to use the, re the resources to acquire and refurbish the building is a purpose restriction, though. So we have to factor in, um, you know, in our fund balance, make sure that we're tracking the expenditures accordingly so that we can appropriately show that restriction of either net position or fund balance. So there's our journal entry right up front. We can recognize this revenue, $5 million. That covers it for GASB 33 and kind of the accounting side of things. I know maybe a bit deeper into the accounting than, than some of you may used to be getting into, but again, I think good to have that background and, and really understand why this, this information, drilling down, being able to get the information from the agreements and communicate it to finance is so important. I'd be happy to address any questions on GASB 33 at this point. If not, I was just going to quickly go over a, a brief brief overview on uniform guidance. Uh, Kim Kimberly is going to get in much more into the details on it, but just want to kind of give a quick overview on uniform guidance and also the single audit process, how that works, um, and what you can expect if you have not had one of your major programs audited uh, recently. Um, it's probably just a matter of time. It's not necessarily driven by dollar amount. It's driven by risk and, you know, how long it's been looked at. So it's very likely, you know, you could just have a major program that may not exceed, you know, the, the um, quantitative thresholds identified by uniform guidance, but um, taking in some of the qualitative factors, you would. Um, so, again, I think just a good thing to go over. Uh, so just quickly here, the, the goals of uniform guidance, uh, you know, is, is really just to streamline, consolidate. It consolidated eight of the OMB circulars, um, reduces administrative uh, burden. There's really a strong emphasis on performance. I think you'll see that as, as Kim's kind of working through her slides. Uh, you know, and, and really just targets waste, fraud, and abuse. Uniform guidance is a uh, government-wide framework for grants. Um, so it's an authoritative set of rules and requirements um, that supersede guidance from the previous OMB circulars. That includes OMB A87 and A133, which were probably the most relevant to you all here at the county. Um, the entire 200, um, 2 CFR 200 section is about 200 pages printed out, so a lot of volume there, a lot of, you know, wide scope, uh, so a lot of information is covered in there. Uh, subpart A has actually 99 separate sections. Uh, B deals with general uh, information. C deals with the pre-award requirements. So I'm going to cover a few things in B and C today. Uh, Kim's really going to get heavy in D, E, and F. Um, and, and just want to also point out that uniform guidance is always being updated. So if, if you're not doing it yourself and going out and making sure that you're staying up to date on what's going on, uh, make sure somebody's designated to be doing that and monitoring at least on an annual basis, but I would you know, recommend much more often than that, probably quarterly. Uh, make sure you're looking at uniform guidance requirements and, and what changes are on the, the horizon. Procurement's a huge one that Teresa's going to cover for us t today. Uh, quickly, just go over the use of should and must. So should represents best practices or recommended approach in uniform guidance. Must means it's required. And there's 800 musts in uniform guidance. Non-compliance with one must results in a single audit finding in some form. So that's why it's important. Again, we understand what the requirements are. Uh, you know, we all want to execute on these programs and, and do the right thing and have a successful program. And just having that understanding up front is going to be the key to be able to do that. Uh, key administrative requirements. So this is um, deals with uh, conflicts of interest. Just want to point out 200.112 just basically states that any known conflicts be written in writing. So this is different from section 200.318, which Teresa and, and Kim will, will likely touch on, um, which basically says that you need to maintain standards of conduct that govern the action of employees involved in the procurement process here at the county. Uh, so it's important to not just stop at 200.112, but just want to make sure I differentiate the two there. Into subpart C, and this deals with the pre-award requirements. Um, 
And two on, yep, we, so 200-205 deals with the review of risk for all applicants. Um, and again, this is on the, the awarding agency side, but just want to point out a few things here because it is kind of important that you understand. So they're evaluating risks when they're looking at these grant agreements, and this directly affects you know, whether you're going to get this funding or not. So they're considering you know, financial stability, performance history, audit reports. So they're relying on that CAFR I mentioned. They're relying on that single audit report that the counties haven't done every year um, and any indirect cost information that's been communicated. 200-210 deal, details the information contained in a federal award. Um, that's going to include your DUNS number, federal, federal award identification number, period of performance, cost sharing, uh, CFDA number, project description, all those things which I'm sure you're pretty well familiar with. Performance goals. Um, so performance goals are very program specific. Uh, the pass-through entity or the feds should communicate the indicators and milestones associated with these performance goals. If not, it's always good to be proactive and make sure that you reach out and have good understanding. Yes. Uh, catalog of federal assistance. Catalog of federal assistance. Domestic assistance. Um, so that's the uh, that's basically the federal award identifying number for that particular grant that you're dealing with. So the first two numbers indicate which agency it's coming from, and then the second three will indicate the actual program itself. Um, not all programs, it's important to note that not all programs will have a CFDA number. Uh, some, some will not. Um, and, and there are certain steps which we're, we're going to cover on the CFA that you need to take. Um, but if you visit the CFDA.gov website, you, you should be able to you know, look up the grant that you're most familiar with or working with, um, and that'll kind of give you the background on that program, and also uh, you'll be able to find the CFDA number associated with it. So that covers it on performance goals, uh, 200-302. Uh, so this is the post-award requirements. This is on most uh, of the grantees. So um, from subpart D, so identification of all federal awards. Uh, Kim's going to discuss this a little later, but a grant roll forward worksheet is going to be your best friend in, in making sure that we're identifying everything and not missing everything. Disclosure of financial results in accordance with the uh, reporting requirements here. Supporting records. Um, so it's very important. We need to document, document, document. Uh, Kim's going to emphasize that. Um, documentation is, is very key in, in making sure that we have the items in the supporting documentation. Information on authorizations, obligations, unobligated balances, um, assets, expenditures, income, interest. We need to make sure that we have the supporting documents. It doesn't need to be in the form of paper. You know, we're, nobody's uh, saying to, to maintain these, uh, you know, huge box or whatever it might be. We don't want to go back. Um, but just making sure that we have supporting records, whether it be email strings or whatever it is, um, to support authorizations and, you know, thought process and, and conclusions and um, everything that needs to be supported there. Uh, 200-302. Uh, coming along here with the financial management system. So effective um, internal controls over financial management system. Kim is going to discuss a lot of that. Budgetary comparison shouldn't be much of an issue for the county. Uh, I know we're uh, providing budget to actual information on a consistent basis, uh, not only to the board, but also department heads and uh, anybody uh, who, who would need that information on a monthly basis. Written procedures to implement the requirements of Section 200-305. This deals with cash management. And again, gets into expenditure driven or you know advanced type grants or, or getting the money up front. And again, Kim's going to cover a lot of that when she discusses cash management. Uh, Section 200-308 mentions deviations. You need to report deviations and request prior approvals. So if you have a deviation, you need to reach out to your grantor. Um, so what's a deviation? That could be a change in scope, could be a change in key personnel, or needed extensions. I know that a lot of times we request extensions, and um, it's, it is a pretty routine type situation. 90 days after end of, end of period, um, the performance report should be submitted, and all obligations should be liquidated. Again, oftentimes we will see extensions associated with those. As long as they're documented, approved, certainly nothing wrong with that. Any questions on uniform guidance? Again, we're going to get a lot deeper into it, just that's kind of the tip of the iceberg on what we'll be looking at. Uh, single audit overview then. Uh, so again, we're doing a single audit um, 
you know, because any grants funded by the federal government must be administered according to the federal regulations. And notice here, we don't stop at federal. We look at state laws and specific terms of the condition of the award. So it's important to not fall into the trap of, I'm just going to look at CFDA.gov, or I'm going to go out to the compliance supplement, identify my requirements, and I'm done. Need to read the agreement. Need to make sure we go through the agreement and understand the key requirements in the agreement. Not only from the financial side, but there's also some program side type issues that you can identify in there um, and make sure that you have a plan in place for addressing and having that internal control over compliance in place to execute the program in compliance with the requirements. Um, so what qualifies as a federal award? I, I won't read the definition here, but um, again, in most cases, it's going to be you know, a grant award from either the feds directly here to the county, or it could be coming through some type of pass-through entity. Um, don't fall into the trap of assuming, since it comes from a pass-through entity, that you're not going to have to deal with the requirements. You are going to have to deal with the requirements. Um, they are passed through to you. Uh, we'll also point out that federal awards can come in, in other forms, could include non-cash assistance, loan proceeds, property, uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to just be that standard monetary uh, award. So a single audit, when's it required? Well, for the county, it's basically required every year because you get enough funding. Um, under OMB Circular A133, it used to be a $500,000 expenditure threshold, so if you spend more than five hundred in a year, you were, you were subject to a single audit. Uniform guidance bumped that up to $750,000. Obviously, didn't help the county too much. Um, you still have that requirement, but um, if any entity that spends $750,000 or more in a fiscal year is required to have a single audit. Again, not too relevant to the county per se here, but if you do have subrecipients that you're dealing with with your grant funding, you, you could run into a scenario where they may not be aware of this, or, or, the, or the thresholds, you know, may have changed here. And, uh, you need to make sure that if they're spending 750, not just of the money you're giving them, but in total of federal expenditures, they need to have a single audit done. This slide here just breaks out the responsibilities of auditors, um, and I'll briefly go over each of these. So determine if the financial statements are fairly presented. That should really be nothing new. We come in on an annual basis and we're looking at the CAFR to determine whether it's free of material misstatement and presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Furthermore, since we're doing a single audit, we're, doing, we're, we're providing what's referred to as a yellow book opinion. Uh, so this is government auditing standards. Requires a few more procedures for us to take place. Um, and then in addition to that, we're providing an opinion on compliance as it relates to the major programs of the county, and that's really what they're looking for um, in, in the single audit. We need to have a certain percentage of coverage and um, make sure that we're auditing each major program and, and really looking at the requirements of each. And so that's why I mentioned if you have not had a major program select, your, your program selected as major, it's probably just a matter of time. Um, you know, the determination of what's audited as major is both quantitative and qualitative, um, and, and, and we try to get you know a good rotation um, on an annual basis, and it is it is risk driven. Uh, the CFA we're looking at the schedule of expenditure of of, it, of federal awards and looking at that in relate at it in relation to the financial statements. So we want to make sure that it's accurately presented in accordance with the financial statements. Understanding and testing internal control over compliance. This one's huge. Um, and it's, it's big because auditing standards dictate that we plan our audit to achieve a low level of control risk. Basically what's that, what that's saying is that we need to really look at the internal controls. We want to be able to go in and look at your internal controls over compliance. So your internal controls, um, not only on the expenditures that are going out, but we want to look at the internal controls on cash management. We want to look at the internal controls on reporting. Who's reviewing and approving reports? Um, so we need to really beat up the internal controls over compliance. Auditing standards tell us we have to do that. In addition, we have to make sure that you're compliant with the requirements of the program. So we're going to test compliance, but we're also really going to test internal control over compliance. And that's why Kim's going to spend about 35 to 40 minutes talking about just the internal control side of things. Uh, we're determining whether the auditee complied with the program, following up on any prior audit findings, issuing any current reporting findings, which could come in many forms, uh, depending on the nature of the finding, um, whether there's question costs associated with it, 
whether it's internal control over compliance, internal control over financial reporting, we're looking at all of it. And, and that's why it's good to have this group of people in the, in, the, in the room because we are looking at, again, internal control over financial reporting, internal control over compliance. We're required to get the data collection form signed and submitted. That's going to happen within 30 days of the issuance of the report or nine months after fiscal year end. It's going to be whichever one comes first. Some of the audit ease responsibilities, so you're going to arrange for the single audit. Uh, prepare the financial statements. That's, that's nothing new. The county's been doing that. The county's going to prepare the CIFA with the hopefully working with, the, with a, a nice grant roll forward schedule, which we're going to go through a template today with. Providing access, following up and taking action on corrective uh, or corrective action on findings, uh, looking at prior audit findings, and preparing a corrective action plan. Again, Kim's going to discuss that a little more, but um, don't stop with the one in your single audit. You also have um, an internal one that, that we'll get into some more detail on. A few more minutes here. Um, just want to go over a few things on the CIFA. So the, again, the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. So this is pretty much a listing of, of everything that the county has received, either directly from the feds, through pass-through entities, um, broken out by agency and by um, CFDA cluster. So just some internal control considerations. We need to make sure that we have underlying support for our CIFA. We, we can't just pull a number from a grant agreement and assume it's been spent out of the general fund or assume it's been spent, um, which again is, is why we're going to refer back to our grant roll forward spreadsheet. Management review and approval. So as, as finance is compiling the CIFA, it shouldn't be a finance, just finance kind of working through the CIFA. You, you want to have your program people involved. You want to have the program people reviewing certain things such as pass-through numbers, pass-through entities. It's, it's not even so much just the number that's being listed there. If you have incorrect information in CFDA number, pass-through entity number, that could cause you headaches and could cause you to have to reissue the CIFA. Um, so taking an active role and in being involved in the preparation of the CIFA is, is very crucial and will help uh, come out at time. So some common deficiencies. Uh, I won't read through each one of these, but um, First one I had mentioned, not reconciling to the financial record, records. We certainly don't want that. Again, names of pass-through entities or the federal agency is, is missing. Um, if you're showing multiple lines for one CFDA number, you should be showing a total for that CFDA. Uh, the correct CFDA number not being reported. The correct name of the program not being reported. Again, all great things that you know maybe the program people could, could take a look at and make sure that is accurate in what's uh, being, being reported. It's a nice little checklist if you want to um, kind of flag this page uh, for things you can go through as you're working through the CIFA and just making sure. Um, again, these are some common pitfalls that we see in CIFA preparation. So as you're working through, um, kind of going through uh, this checklist and making sure that you're addressing each of the, each of the items issued here. Uh, again, just some common issues here. If there's any loan or loan guarantee programs, uh, do we have the outstanding balance at year end? Uh, do we describe the significant accounting policies used in preparing the CIFA? The CIFA doesn't have to be the same basis of accounting as the CAF, or in most cases it is for ease of use, but um, in most cases it is going to be just accrual. Noting whether the, account, the auditee elected to use the 10% de minimis cost rate is also a required disclosure, which the county actually does not. Um, here, so what, when, when does this actual expenditure occur? So besides the obvious of when the expenditure, um, when the transaction related to the grant occurs, some other examples could include the items listed here. So program income could come into play sometimes when you're um, using that program income. Um, you know, disbursement of funds passed through to subrecipients too is, is also when that transaction is going to take place. Be aware of clusters. Um, you should be able to identify those in the compliance supplement. Kim's going to kind of point those out too. Um, but just be aware of whether your program falls under a cluster, and if it does, it needs to be reported accordingly on the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. This is just an example CIFA, um, and it's going to have some of the elements that we had, we had discussed. Um, so this one has the highway safety cluster. Um, again, we're listing out federal grantor, pass-through grantor, program cluster. We got a total here for, for, for the agency. This is our column for the CFDA number. 
um, you know, we're indicating our major program. So all the required elements as part of the CIFA, and obviously I would encourage you to go back uh, to last year's single audit report, and um, you know you could view the county CIFA if you have not already done so. You should certainly identify the program you have, um, along with uh, with the rest of the programs for the county, and just have a kind of better understanding of how it's being reported, and um, you know with that checklist now, uh, making sure that all the required data elements are included. Yes. With that, um, if anybody would want to come and chat about GASB with me, I'd be happy to. Um, if not, um, we have a, a little break here. Maybe take 10 minutes, and Kim will get into the internal control over compliance side of things.